This video is brought to you by Zavi's new Star Trek merch line. Sci-fi television is no stranger to unjustly cancelled shows. Firefly, Farscape, The Expanse briefly, and even the original series of Star Trek. But while these shows have gone on to birth dedicated cult fandoms or even a sprawling multimedia franchise, some aren't so lucky. So was the fate of Space Above and Beyond. Created by X-Files scribes James Wong and Glenn Morgan, Space Above and Beyond chronicles the tale of humanity's first contact and subsequent war with an alien race. While it's a setup we've become extremely familiar with as sci-fi fans, Above and Beyond's radical departure from what was established sci-fi TV style and unique world building presents us with a story with a hell of a lot of surprising nuance and depth. Looking back on the show's overall presentation from a modern context is pretty interesting. You have to remember that this was 1995, in the thick of Star Trek's TV dominance, the second year of Babylon 5's epic space opera, and before the likes of Stargate SG-1, among others which would later go on to define what I have previously referred to as the golden age of sci-fi TV. Audiences had come to expect sci-fi shows to be about colourful aliens, weird anomalies, and set crews of characters wearing space-age uniforms going on adventures, which is why Fox, its original network, didn't really know what to do with Space Above and Beyond. Here there aren't an array of aliens, there's just one which we don't know the real name of and don't get very many glimpses of. This isn't a crew on an intrepid starship representing the best of humanity, this is a squad of ordinary people thrust into an interplanetary war representing only a single country. Their colour palette is muted into greys and browns, with a production design which leans far closer into modern military technology. Rather than the incredible classes of advanced explorer ships, Space Above and Beyond is almost a precursor to Halo in its approach to design. Battle groups of large carriers, fighters, bombers, and dropships, as well as land vehicles. There's a deliberate practicality in the design work of the show. While shows like Babylon 5 still manage to create grounded looking human ships, they're still pretty flashy. But much of the craft here aren't as sleek or cool looking. Above and Beyond's approach to its visuals feels like a trial run for what would later be perfected in the rebooted Battlestar Galactica. While BSG would take heavy inspiration from shows like 24 or The West Wing, Space Above and Beyond was instead taking a leaf out of far more classical World War II stories. This is even reflected in the score by DC Animated Universe veteran Shirley Walker. While at times it does veer into that overly patriotic, sombre military style, it's still a score which carries the action and emotional beats in terrific fashion. The VFX generally hold up quite well, while Babylon 5's Chris Foss-like colourful ship designs inadvertently highlighted the low-res textures and rough modelling, the CGI in Above and Beyond is actually aided by its grittier visual approach. While the human designs deliberately avoid the cool factor for the most part, that doesn't stop the show from showcasing some cool alien designs for the Chigs, the nickname given to the mysterious alien race. While the ships and craft for the Chigs retain that sense of practicality, they have a cool B-movie-esque 1950s design to them, but updated just enough to fit comfortably in the more grounded aesthetic of the human-centric designs. I simply love the design of the Chig armour, which we only get close-ups of quite rarely. It's a really cool looking design with an instantly recognisable silhouette, almost as if it's been lifted right out of a Tales to Astonish front cover. Yet at the same time, it looks functional. We believe this is a working set of battle armour, simply created by something other than a human mind. And it's this great balance between referencing classic war stories and using them to put new spins on established sci-fi tropes, which informs so much of the show's great storytelling. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. This video was brought to you by a new Star Trek merch line launching on the 29th at Zavi.com, a slew of brand new, very cool designs to satiate your Star Trek itch. I myself really like this Section 31-esque jumper, which I was kindly gifted with. It's got a really nice embroidered design, one of many really cool designs in this range, and is pretty cosy for these winter months. Click the link below on the 29th and use the promo code BATTLE20 for 20% off the Star Trek range, or the code BATTLE10 for 10% off the site-wide items. You'd expect a war story to feature a hell of a lot of action-packed episodes, but that's not what Space Above and Beyond is really interested in. While there are plenty of enjoyable space battles and gunfights throughout, the focus is always on the morality of what is happening and the personal consequences for its characters. There's the archetypal naive rookies becoming hardened soldiers through battle stories, but there's also some fantastically unique episodes which you simply wouldn't get in any other sci-fi show. These stories are well engineered thanks largely to the fantastic world building on display. While the Chigs are the big bads, humanity Humanity's record is far from squeaky clean. The backstory of this world centres on numerous elements of the often mentioned AI wars. It's the classic scenario of rebellious robots, but there's a cool spin on it here. The robots, or syndics as they're called here, behave far less 
well, robotically than you'd expect. They're emotional and impulsive, even passionate and at times psychopathic. This all stems from the way in which the Syndics came to rebel in the first place. Rather than the usual, machines see humanity as a threat and strike first scenario, the creator of these Syndics instead implanted a simple idea. Take a chance. An idea which precipitated into the Syndics taking a chance for their own freedom. The Syndics we then encounter have this usually human notion hardwired into their brains. It allows them to act on gut feelings, it makes them desperate and dangerous at the same time. And once again the design work is wonderful. These beaten up shells with exposed panelling and circuits made most distinct by their crosshair eyes. In universe it was from the AI wars that an even more fascinating aspect of the show is brought in, the in vitros. To create better soldiers and at a faster rate, the US government grew new people to be birthed at 18 years old and brainwashed into killing machines. But due to the premature end of the war, many in vitros were released into society which had little or no place for them. It's a constant source of tension throughout many episodes. The loyalty of the in vitros, or tanks as they're often called, is continuously questioned. It's one of the rare allegories for racism which actually works. A combination of shameful history and systemic prejudice expressing itself in the despicable actions and attitudes of normal people. This image of an Earth which isn't fully united is another huge departure from your typical sci-fi show. Even Babylon 5 with its President Clark storyline still had a united Earth government. While Above and Beyond holds the Secretary General of the United Nations as the de facto leader of the world, something The Expanse also does, there's still an emphasis on individual nations and the diversity of the human race. Not only does this allow for a ton of intrigue and conspiracy plots to go against the war stories, but it also lets the show pull the rug out from underneath the audience by doing the same for the chicks. One of my favourite episodes is Who Monitors the Birds? An episode with almost no dialogue following a single character on a Black Ops mission behind enemy lines. We flash back to his early life as an in vitro in an education centre. While being trained as a cold killer, curiosity compels him to look up and wonder who monitors the birds. And while in the thick of his mission, his rifle trained on a Chig soldier, he witnesses his alien enemy doing the same thing. It's one small moment among many in the show which surprises the audience who brought in to the simple us against the aliens premise. I'm not going to spoil all the ways in which this thread is expressed, but it makes for a stunning final few episodes. The characters, for me at least, are a slow burn to truly invest in. The opening episodes paint them as mostly archetypes. The rookie with a sweetheart girlfriend, the loose cannon bad boy, the G.I. Jane, the tough as nails commanding officer, but over time these archetypes are broken down and made more interesting. Nathan West, who started off as my least favourite character, transforms into a battle-hardened soldier whose hope of finding his lost love diminishes as his trauma builds up. In another one of my favourite episodes, Stay With The Dead, we spend the entire episode with West as he relives the brutality of a recent battle. Morgan Weiss's performance is simply incredible, and the audience is first to confront a side of war which is often avoided and largely misunderstood. Cooper Hawks starts off as the maverick loose cannon, but his status as an in vitro gives him a childlike personality. He's easily the most capable fighter in the squad, but is like a nervous toddler in social situations. His evident crush on fellow squad mate Venson has him acting like a shy kid trying to work up the courage to ask his classmate to a dance. He also bears the brunt of many discriminatory actions, tearing him between the loyalty to his country and loyalty to his in vitros. And Venson's own femininity actually survives her portrayal as a steadfast squad leader, something which is quite rare. The same revelation of relatability and dimensionality happens to virtually every character in the show. After a while, some of the best scenes are simply watching this squad sit around and chat in their bunks, talking about the lives they left behind, what they hope to do should the war ever end, questions they have about their enemy, questions they have about their leaders. That's ultimately what makes Space Above and Beyond so terrific as a sci-fi series, because it does what so much great sci-fi does. It uses the tropes and staples of the genre to tell a truly human-centric story. But while Star Trek did that as a colourful outer space adventure, and Babylon 5 did it as an epic space opera, Space Above and Beyond did it with an attempt to tell a real feeling war story, but unfortunately it didn't get the chance to tell its whole story. As mentioned before, Fox just didn't know what to do with the show. Was this something to sell to the Star Trek crowd? Well, no, because this is more of a military drama. Then maybe it could be sold to the military drama crowd. Well, no, because it still has aliens and robots and stuff. Space Above and Beyond's biggest failure is that it was simply ahead of its time. Battlestar Galactica and The Expanse have proven there is an audience for grittier and more grounded sci-fi, which can exist alongside the more colourful, fast-paced space adventure types. But in 1995, networks simply couldn't find it. After one season, the show was cancelled due to poor ratings. While this wasn't in the realm of Farscape being cancelled on a cliffhanger, 
Like Firefly, it makes us wonder what might have been. What was to feature in the planned five season run? What might have happened in the unfolding war? What new places would our characters be brought to? Questions which will unfortunately never be answered. But as it stands, Space Above and Beyond is an awesome 23 episode run. If anything in this video has piqued your interest, then it's absolutely worth tracking down. Daniel Clark asks, favourite Babylon 5 character? There are so many great characters in that show it's hard to choose. I'm actually re-watching it just now. I'll probably change my mind as soon as I say this, but I'll go for Londo Malari right now. Just such a deeply tragic character, but also an endlessly entertaining one. It's a real testament to Peter Jurisic that he can have that hairstyle and that accent, yet still move you to tears with his monologues. Mosura Big Fluffy Mouth All Out Attack, great name, asks, will you do videos on Space Battleship Yamato? If this Hidden Gem series takes off, then yes, absolutely. I really enjoyed the recent shows and think it's a really cool universe. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos early for as little as $5 a month. Speaking of which, special thanks to all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and until next time, live long and prosper.